All right, so today we are going to be talking about the Hush Hush Quadrilogy, Quartet, whatever you want to call that. Uh, this is the first of that pile of angel young adult romance books I bought a couple of months ago that I got through. And um, I don't hate it. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Like, I'll come right out and say now, these books are mediocre for the most part. Uh, but then they get kind of good. I think the last book is actually fairly decent. And I'm hardly gonna sing its praises, yes, but I I, I really can't get that angry at them. They're, they're perfectly all right for some of the time. Uh, other times they're really stupid and annoying, but you know, that's what we're here to talk about. So this video is going to be in a different format than what I've done before. So uh, if you're watching this, you've probably seen at least one of my really long in-depth uh, book reviews, which are like 90 minutes long. And you've probably seen some of my regular book reviews, which are spoiler free and they're like 10 to 15 minutes. This one, I'm going to try something uh, more medium length. So I'm still going to read these and go into detail on them. But I'm not going to go in as much detail. Like, you can see I didn't really use tabs for these. Like, I have a, a couple that are in there. That Those are just for, like, really stupid things. But th there's not that many because I didn't want to take that many notes and focus on every little thing the way I normally do. These, I'm going to try mo mostly focusing on the big problems and the stuff that just really annoyed me. And hopefully this will only be 30 to 40 minutes long. You guys are in the future, so you know how well that worked out. So this, like I said, is a Twilight clone, just with angels. You know, it's about a normal, everyday teenage girl named Nora Gray who meets this mysterious bad boy whose name is Patch, and then some weird stuff starts happening, she learns Patch is an angel, and then she's swept up in some big conflict, okay? It's just Twilight, excuse me, but it's with angels instead of vampires. And if you've seen my video on the Fallen series, which if you haven't, I'll put it up here, I, I forget which side the I think goes on, but if you haven't seen it, you can watch that one. And that one was, yeah, basically just Twilight with angels, and it was pretty bad. This one actually came out around the same time as Fallen, and it was, I think, about as popular. They're both uh, bestsellers, but I, I, I will give credit. This one is at least a bit different than <laughs> other stuff I've read in this genre. Now, uh, I'll start off by just saying I think the covers are really cool. Like, they're black and white, but with, like, little spots of red and other colors. And it just, so the red really pops out, you know? And they're all drawn really interestingly. Or, actually, I think these might be photographs. I'm not sure. But either way, they're done in a really interesting way. So it's just dripping with atmosphere and character and uh, emotion that's just coming right off of it, and it looks a lot different from most other covers I've seen, so it instantly stands out in my mind. And it also does showcase an escalation across the course of the series, because it starts off with just, okay, here's an angel falling from heaven, and then it shows, like, people in the rain, and they're alone, and it kind of sucks, and then they're together, but they're in danger, and then the final book is Patch and Nora together again, and they're not in any danger. It's like they can finally be just be a couple, which kind of fits with what happens in the story. If if you'll give me some time, we'll, we'll read through that. And uh, the titles are kind of the same. Like, there's Hush Hush, Crescendo, Silence, and Finale. Like, they have that escalation, and they do all have kind of a theme there. Only question is, um, why are they called that? Really, there, there's no music in this series. Like, I was thinking there'd be some sort of theme about how music is love or something, or maybe one of the characters would just be really into music, like they play violin or something, like, I don't get it, why? This is not about music! Anyways, so from this point forward, there's going to be major spoilers ahead, so if that bothers you, then leave now. If not, let's get started. So first up is Hush Hush, and this one, the prologue starts off with some French duke in the 16th century named Chauncey, who is apparently a Nephilim, he is a combination of angel and human, and then a fallen angel who remains nameless, but it turns out pretty quickly that it, it's Patch. Well, not really a spoiler there, it's pretty obvious from the beginning. And he, Patch forces him into an oath of some sort, we don't know exactly how it works, and this is not a good start. Like, it tries to be mysterious without actually really introducing much of a mystery, 
and because we already know there's angels in this series like just based on the title the premise the covers like we know it's about angels there's no need to play coy with it and well i just i've said it before i'll say it again the prologue is in third person and then it switches to first which most of the series is in it's from nora's perspective and i hate switching from third to first person okay i just do it you're not supposed to think that hard about the narrator or how they would actually write all this down, but it, when you switch like that, it forces you to think about it, and it annoys me. So then we cut to the present day in a small fictional town called Coldwater in Maine, where our friend Nora Gray is with her friend named V in their biology class, and they have a really cringy conversation about sex. At my side, V. Sky said, This is exactly why the school outlaws camera phones. Pictures of this in the e-zine would be all the evidence I'd need to get the Board of Education to axe biology, and then we'd have this hour to do something productive, like receive one-on-one -on -one tutoring from the cute upper-class guys. Why V? I said. I could have sworn you've been looking forward to this unit all semester. V lowered her eyelashes and smiled wickedly. This class isn't going to teach me anything I don't already know. V? As in virgin? I'm not going to go into the bad lines in this series, because there's really not that many of them overall, but pretty much all of them come from V. Like, all of her, Nora and V's conversations, or most of them anyhow, are just trying too hard. <laughs> They're trying way too hard. Like, here, look, personality! They're quirky and weird. Like, no, it's just, it's trying too hard. Let's move on. So in her biology class, Nora is forced to sit next to a mysterious bad boy, whose name is Patch, and they're forced to work on a project together, which she's upset about because Patch is playing super coy and mysterious, and he's difficult to get a hold of, and she keeps trying to talk to him, and he eventually winds up saying, hey, if you want to work with this, yeah, if you want to work with me on this project, then just come to this arcade with me, uh, which is really obnoxious of him. Then let's do the interview over the phone. I've got a list of questions right. He hung up on me. Yeah, he, he, he just hangs up the phone on her because he wants her to come to him rather than doing the absolute bare minimum to make sure they get a decent grade on this project. Like, he, he's a dick at this point. This, this is a bad start. This is a bad start to their romance. But, uh, you know, she eventually goes out there and he's like playing pool and she tries asking him more questions and he's still being coy and everything and he kind of winds up sexually harassing her for a while and talking about how "Ooh, you're cute we should make out blah, blah, blah. like that sort of thing a admittedly there is worse sexual harassment but um it's still not cool it's still not cool like everything patch does for a pretty huge chunk of this book just makes him come across as more of a dick than a brooding bad boy or a loner or anything really so we are later introduced to a cheerleader named Marcy Miller. And Marcy Miller is just kind of a mean, rich girl who Nora dislikes. And they're both just kind of mean to each other. Like, I'll, I'll give it this much that, like, it, Marcy seems to have started it. She seems to just be a bully. But also, Nora doesn't just sit there and take it. She also is really mean and rude back. Like, they... They're kind of vicious when they talk to each other, so neither of them comes out of it looking great, but at least that does give Nora a little bit of character. And that's something I want to uh, really praise the series for, is that the main protagonist, Nora, has actual personality and actual character. Like, she has hopes and dreams and fears and flaws and stuff, which the um, <laughs> pretty much every other entry in this genre doesn't have. Like, the protagonists are total blank slates for the most part, so it's nice to have that change at least a little bit, and Marcy really doesn't do much for the entire rest of the uh, of the book, but she becomes important later, so I guess it's a good thing they brought her in now. And anyways, Nora, while she's out and about at various points, uh, a man seems to be following her in a store, so she just gets in a car, drives off really fast in the middle of a rainstorm, and then another guy, or possibly the same one, uh, just appears in front of her car, she hits him, and she's like, oh fuck, I just killed somebody. But even though he got hit really bad and was laying on the ground, he it winds up jumping right back up, and he actually shatters the window by punching it, 
and Nora has to keep running, and the guy chases after her a little bit and almost catches up with the car, so it's like, okay, he's clearly not a regular human. And then later, when she's telling people about it, she goes to show them, and the window is fine. So Nora thinks, oh, okay, maybe I'm going crazy. And she also thinks that maybe Patch has something to do with it, because, yeah, I don't know, he's mysterious and stuff. And so she winds up going to the school's uh, record office and stealing files to get information on Patch, and the files wind up being empty, which is a bizarrely common trope now that I'm thinking about it. Like, Fallen did the exact same thing. Like, almost word for word. Uh, the main girl protagonist was interested in a bad boy and tried looking for information on him by stealing files from the school. It's, it's weird how often I see that. I, like, I guess it makes sense. It's not uh, a trope that was thrown there for no reason, but it is still odd how often it pops up. So then later she runs into Patch and they start talking again, and this is the first time that he calls her by his nickname for her, Angel. That is the laziest nickname of all time. He may as well just call her beautiful, or woman, or sweetheart, or something like that. Like, it's, for starters, it's just a generic name, which is used a lot. And for another thing, it's really dumb considering the subject matter of this series. Like, this is a series that's actually about angels and stuff, and so there will be times where he's talking to her and calls her angel in the text, and for a moment I was a little uh, c confused about whether he was talking about actual angels or if he was just talking to her. And for that matter, it's used a lot. Okay, I, I didn't count all of them. It's used at least 39 times throughout the series, and I only started counting, like, three quarters of the way through the third book. So, if you were to add it all up, it would be a lot higher. Trust me. But, anyways, her and Patch wind up just running into each other a few more times, and he's still mysterious. And Nora keeps feeling like someone is stalking her, or someone is watching her, but that's... Uh, it doesn't lead to much for a while. And her and V wind up going on a double blind date with uh, these guys named Elliot and Jules. Now, Nora is going with Elliot and Jules, or Jules, or, Jules or something like that? I don't, I don't know. I don't speak French. Uh, he goes with V. And they run... <sighs> Jesus Christ. They run into Patch while they're there, and he makes Nora play billiards with him, and if she loses, then she has to abandon her date and go with him. And of course she loses, because he's really good at billiards. And... Jesus Christ, the... Patch is, like, weirdly controlling, and has no idea when to keep his nose out of other people's business. Like, just... Th everything he does, for most of this book, makes him look bad. Just everything, but... Anyway, she winds up having to go with him, which I guess is fine, because Elliot kind of creeped her out anyways. But And they go to this theme park nearby, and they're on a ride, which is called the Archangel. Get it? Because angels... The, the whole theme park has a bunch of angel-themed stuff. Okay, and, and then Patch takes her home, and while they're there, she's like, Okay, well, thank you, I'm gonna go inside now. And he essentially just shoves past her, and is like, Hey, let's make tacos. And then they, like, he forces his way into her house and starts... <laughs> oh, God, Patch, you're such a creep. Like, it, it becomes even creepier when you realize that he uh, occasionally will just touch her without permission. Like, nothing too inappropriate, but, like, putting his arms around her shoulders and stuff. It's so creepy. That This relationship so far has more red flags than the fucking October Revolution. I am... Just, no, okay. But anyways, most of the rest of the book, Nora gets followed, Patch is being mysterious, uh, nothing is all that noteworthy. The only thing I want to bring up is that Nora does not tell her mom about the trouble that she's in. Because, you see, Nora and her mom live in a farmhouse kind of on the outskirts of town. And about a year before the series begins, Nora's father was murdered. And so her mom had to get a new job, which uh, takes her out of town a lot, uh, in order to afford living in this house, because nothing nearby th that uh, she qualified for would allow her to afford it. And so Nora knows that if she tells her mom about this trouble, she's going to quit her job, get something local so that she can be with her, and they're going to have to move out of their house. And this is Nora's last real connection to her father, so she doesn't want to to leave, even if it means putting herself in danger. And that is 
again, that is an actual bit of character that Nora has. And I, I don't want to make it sound like she's the most three-dimensional, well-rounded character ever, but she is a hell of a lot better than I've learned to expect. And then, while this is happening, she learns Elliot maybe murdered someone, and he also is, seems to be stalking her. So she goes off to another city to investigate, and while she's doing that, she winds up getting trapped. She, long story short, she has to call Pats for help, and he drives over, picks her up, and then while they're driving, his car breaks down, because of course, and then he kind of, basically they have no choice but to stay in a motel for the night and then try and get help in the morning, and Patch kind of coerces her into doing that, and also they have to stay in a room with only one bed because reasons. Jesus Christ, Pat, Pat, th reading this makes me feel like I'm reading the script for a real crime TV show, like Jesus Christ, but what, whatever, basically, while they're in bed, she notices that Patch has these V-shaped scars on his back. Obviously, that's where his wing wings were ripped off. And she touches them and gets some hallucinations. Like, she sees some of his memories and stuff. And so she learns the truth. Patch is a fallen angel. You know, he sided with Lucifer however long ago. But instead of being banished to hell, most of the fallen angels were banished to Earth instead. Um, Alright. And uh, they part of their punishment is that they can't feel anything. Uh, they, like, like, just nothing at all. They can't feel heat, cold, pain, anything. Like, basically every fallen angel is balder from God of War. You know, they just, they want to feel things. And so, the only way they can do that is that during the Hebrew month of Cheshvan, uh, which is about two weeks every year, they can possess Nephilim, who are, you know, half-human, half-angel people, and while they're possessing them, they can feel things. Okay, that is kind of an interesting setup for things. And also, it turns out that Patch, if he kills Nora, and or rather, if he manages to get Nora to sacrifice herself, which is kind of killing her, but he, he can't do it himself, basically. Uh, if he gets her to sacrifice herself, he can become human. So, he, you know, he'll no longer be immortal, but he'll be able to feel and stuff before he dies. Uh, and he wound up deciding not to, because he was following her for a while, and he's like, you know what, she's an alright person. Nora is, uh, upset by this, uh, obviously, like, why, why wouldn't she be? And, well, no, that's, that's the big thing here. <laughs> Nora is upset by this. And I also just have one question. Uh, if, okay, so the way Nephilim are created is if a fallen angel possesses a person, and then they have sex, then the baby will be a Nephilim. And sometimes, many generations down the line, their descendants will turn into a Nephilim. Like, it, it lays dormant for however long. And it also appears that Nora is a descendant of Chauncey, the French duke from the prologue who Patch uh, was possessing, uh, on her father's side, they think uh, it comes from. But the thing is, if, if fallen angels can only possess Nephilim, and Nephilim can only be created by a fallen angel possessing somebody. How did the first Nephilim get created at all? Anyone? Anyone at all? No? Okay, it, it's only the cornerstone through which most of the series comes from. You know, it's not that important to think about. Yo, kill me with this shit. Also, Nephilim are immortal, I guess. Which is a thing, definitely. Okay, let's kick this into overdrive. Basically... Patch has an angel girlfriend who wants to prevent Patch from becoming human, so she tries to kill Nora, and then she fails. And then it turns out that Jules, remember Elliot's friend that they went on a uh, double date with, uh, is Chauncey. He, he's the French Duke from the beginning, and he wants to kill Nora so that he can get revenge on Patch, because Patch keeps, you know, possessing him every year, and that kind of sucks. And he, he obviously can't kill Patch, so he's just gonna kill the one he loves, and that's revenge. And so he kidnaps V in order to lure Nora out, and they go to the school where she's being held captive, and they try to rescue her, and basically Nora winds up uh, jumping off of the roof and dying, but then she immediately comes back because Patch rejected her sacrifice. I'm not sure how that's how that works, because also when he rejects her sacrifice, 
apparently that automatically resets it so that her sacrifice was used to kill Jules, because apparently that is a way you can kill Nephilim, is by sacrificing your life. Not explained very well, and also, if you didn't actually sacrifice your life, like, if you came back, then it doesn't really count as a sacrifice. How does that work? I don't understand. Whatever, uh, in, at the end of the book, Nora and Patch make the kissy with each other, like, they're a couple now, and they're like, yeah, well, let's, let's be together, rock on, bro. And that's the end. Now, <clears throat> like I said, pretty mediocre book, a uh, lot of time is kind of wasted in there. Well, not a lot of time, but a, a lot of time is spent just building up the mystery without a lot else happening. Uh, but it's really not awful, there is some character, there are some decent story beats, and it is self-contained, actually. Like, there is room for sequels, obviously, but it is, y you can just read this one and come away with it like, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I got half a story there, I can... I can re read just that and be satisfied. It gets worse after that, but you know, that that one really isn't as bad as it could have been. So book two, Crescendo, uh, starts off a couple of weeks later when Nora and Patch have been dating for a little while and they're having a problem. You see, the problem is that Patch won't say he loves her, which is kind of an issue, but uh, I mean, they haven't been together that long. And, uh, also he starts hanging out with Marcy, the mean girl that Nora hates, so, uh, I guess that's, uh, I guess that's a problem. And Nora's upset by this, so she starts chilling with her old friend Scott, who they knew each other as kids, and then he moved away, and now he's moving back. And it also turns out he's a Nephilim, so he knows about all this stuff, and... Oh, okay, cool. And she also... Uh, compounding all of this stuff that's upsetting her, she gets a note saying that someone called the Black Hand murdered her father, and she's like, oh, who who was this Black Hand? I don't understand. And then, anyways, Patch and Nora break up, and Patch starts dating Marcy, because, look, I, I hate this plot point for two reasons. I, I don't just think it's dumb and stupid. I hate this plot point for two reasons. One, we know Patch and Nora are going to be together by the end of the series. Like, there's... It's just very blatantly obvious from the way it's all set up that that's how it's going to end. Like, even though they tease a little bit, oh, maybe Nora and Scott really like each other, it's very half-assed, even by the standards of this genre. Like, think about it. While reading Twilight, did you ever really think that Bella and Jacob were going to end up together? Like, no, you didn't. Uh, so we know it's just going to end up that way, so it's a waste of time. And two... Her and Patch didn't quite have love at first sight, <clears throat> but it's close enough because they didn't know each other that well or for that long before they decided, oh, we're in love now. And that love at first sight uh, cliche can kind of work if you just, sh after that, you just show the couple being together. Like, you know, you show them being in love, you show them going over the trials and tribulations of being in a relationship, you show them uh, working together, trusting each other, all that. It can work if you do that, and for the bulk of this book, you don't get to see Patch and Nora be a couple. Actually, for the bulk of the third book as well. Uh, we'll get to that when the time comes, but it, I just hate this plot point for those two reasons. So someone tells Nora that Patch is the Black Hand, and she's like, no, it couldn't be him, but maybe it is. Patch killed my dad, and then she's sad. And also, Marcy tells Nora that Nora's mother had an affair with Marcy's dad, named Hank. And so she's saying, like, hey, Nora, you're actually, you're, the guy you thought was your dad is actually not your dad. Your dad is also my dad, and we're sisters, and uh, I kind of liked that at first. Because, it, like, one, it is upsetting Marcy more, or not Marcy, it's upsetting Nora more, and so she has to, you know, learn to deal with more of this stuff, which is showing some character growth, and I liked that. But <clears throat> it also felt like w when we learned that she was a Nephilim, it was saying, like, She's special. She's not the chosen one, but it's kind of like being the chosen one. And, you know, just because of the way she was born. And this felt almost like a uh, an inverse of that, where it's saying, oh, <clears throat> you thought you were special, but it turns out you're just a normal person. Like, yeah, your dad was just a human. And that, that was kind of the opposite of what it usually is. So I thought that was kind of cool, but it turns out that's not the case. Like, it turns out uh, Marcy's father, Hank, is is her father but also he's a Nephilim, so doesn't add much. And anyways, TLDR, a different uh, Nephilim is the Black Hand, 
and the heroes, and by heroes I mean Patch, Nora, and Scott, uh, kill him, and it turns out Patch was with Marcy because he wanted to spy on Hank for a while, and then her, or Nora and Patch are like, oh, okay, I guess we're together again, all is forgiven, which it really shouldn't be, because I feel like Patch could have just told Nora about that. Like, he could have just said, hey, look, there might be something going on here. We can still be together, but we have to keep it on the DL, and I'm just going to pretend to be dating this other person. Is that cool? Okay, because, you know, he doesn't seem to trust her, and he wants to keep things from her, which is not the basis for a healthy relationship, but, uh... Okay, we'll just... Again, red flags. Lots of, lots of red flags. Lots of red flags. I... Nope, just lots of red flags. And anyways, it, the book ends with Hank uh, capturing them, and he's talking to Nora, and he's basically like, So, Nora, I heard you killed my friend Chauncey, and that's it. Which is a good cliffhanger. I'll give it that. I, I immediately wanted to know what happens after that, but the um, it, it feels kind of like you only had half a story, because there's huge parts of this which are just wasted by Nora angsting, and it's not that interesting. And then, but... You know, it, it is a good cliffhanger. I'll give it that. Then we get to book three, Silence, and that cliffhanger is ruined. And you might be wondering, James, how do you ruin such a good cliffhanger? Well, you see, Nora has amnesia in this book. And the thing is, she it, it starts off, uh, I think, three months after the end of the last book. So, like, Nora was missing for that whole time, and then she comes back and she doesn't remember any of her time there. Which sounds kind of good or I'm sorry, she was uh, gone for two months and missed out all of her time there, which sounds kind of good, but then you realize her missing memory goes back five months, which means she doesn't remember the events of the first two books either. She doesn't remember anything about angels or Patch or Nephilim or anything. And we spend the first 170 fucking pages of this book just getting her caught up to speed. That's stupid! Use your common sense! Like, it is just Nora uh, seeing some mysterious stuff around, which is, like, magic and everything, and she's like, oh, what's going on here? I don't know. And her trying to get caught up before eventually she <clears throat> she gets caught up. All of the tension, in addition to just being really annoying to have to retread all this old ground, all of the tension is gone But when you do that. Normally, amnesia works uh, as a way of building tension and giving the characters a clear goal to work towards because the audience and the characters are both in the dark here. Uh, but in this instance, usually amnesia, they will have it from the beginning for that very reason. Like, they don't get it in the middle. The only um, other thing I can think of that did something kind of like this, and even then they did it well, was the finale of the first season of Mr. Robot. Now, uh, minor spoilers for that show, but, I mean, I've only seen the first season, so I can't spoil it that much. Basically, uh, the penultimate episode of that season, <clears throat> the good guy, I forget his name, Rami Malek's character, uh, is forced to tell the bad guy about his plan to, like, hack people and save the world, yada yada. And <clears throat> the next episode starts off, like, two or three days later, and Rami Malek doesn't remember anything, like... He doesn't know what happened, the bad guy is missing, and he knows that they did something bad, but they don't know exactly what it was, and he, he doesn't know how they did it or anything. And so he is going around looking and trying to get his memory back, or tr rather trying to find out what happened when he blacked out, or something like that. And so that works pretty well to build tension, but this doesn't, this, this does not... Also, while Nora was gone, her mom was super worried, and so she started dating Hank, remember Marcy's dad, and, um, I, I mean, okay, that, that does make sense from uh, her mom's perspective. You know, her daughter was missing, her husband was murdered not that long ago. It makes sense she'd want to find some sort of emotional connection to latch on to. That's fine. And even though Nora doesn't know anything about what's going on at this point, she still is kind of suspicious about Hank, and he's just kind of like, hey, I... I just want to get to know you, you know? I, I want to spend some time with you and Marcy and all them. I'm trying to have a relationship with my kids, and I can't do it! And it, one interesting bit is that throughout this whole segment, uh, it's made pretty clear that everyone thought that, even though she's not talking about it, because again, she doesn't remember anything, it, it, everyone seems to think that Marcy was uh, j 
chained up in a basement somewhere and getting raped a whole bunch for the past couple of months, but no one is comfortable saying it in as many words, and it's just a... Uh, it's just a little uncomfortable to read about. Pole girls against their wheel, chain them up in my basement. So eventually, Nora gets Scott to fill her in, and he tells her about all the fallen angels and Patch and everything, and she's like, oh, okay, I guess that makes sense, whatever. She buys into it a little too quick, if you're, if you're asking me, but honestly, I just wanted this part to be done, so it's not that big a deal. And uh, it, it turns out that basically Hank is building a Nephilim army so that he can fight the fallen angels because... They are essentially treated like slaves, at least for two weeks out of the year. And Scott takes her to a fallen angel hideout to see if they can find Patch. And the one tab I put in this book, the one tab is that hideout. Because it turns out that the fallen angels, as long as they've been on Earth, for all the thousands of years that's been, they have just been hanging out on the coast of Maine, out in the middle of nowhere, and they dug a bunch of tunnels and caves and stuff to hide out in, which doesn't make a lot of sense because they can just blend into human society, but okay. And then, in order to sustain themselves, which is weird because they don't need to pay rent or eat food or anything like that, in order to sustain themselves, they built that theme park with all the angel rides and everything. In addition to just not making that much sense, that's just really dumb. You know, I can't really harp on it that much for being, like, inconsistent or anything. It's a little uh, weird and doesn't make that much sense, but I, I can't harp on that too much. It's just dumb. That's about all I have to say there. It's just dumb. Anyways, they find Patch, and it turns out that the reason uh, Hank kidnapped Nora and him was that they wanted Patch to be a spy and walk among the fallen angels uh, so, so that they can prepare for their, you know, rebellion where they, like, kill them all or something. Uh, he wanted Patch to just spy on them, give him information, and he was going to hold Nora hostage for a while until he agreed to do that, and he agrees to do that, so yay. And then by that point we're like two-thirds through the book, so you know. And the TLDR is that Hank wants to rebel, like I said, because slavery, and while he's explaining what it's like to be possessed, he uses some, uh, he uses some interesting language. Do you have any idea what it's like to have someone come inside you? And completely take over? And he's not the only one to do that. They, they Repeatedly, whenever they're talking about angels possessing somebody, they refer to it as coming inside them. That, why? Seriously, j there's this thing called a 13-year-old boy filter, and what you need to do is have a 13-year-old boy read all your stuff, and if he can find a way to make it sexual, may maybe just change up some of the wording. At this point, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to root for, though, because with both sides, it kind of sucks. Like, obviously, it does suck to get possessed, but it also sucks to not be able to feel anything ever, so I can understand why the Fallen Angels would be desperate enough to do that, even if they weren't awful people to begin with. But also, for the Nephilim, it's really only two weeks out of the year where you're possessed, so like as awful as that is, it's not like it's for eternity or anything, but at the same time, like, I'm just not sure who I'm supposed to be rooting for here. Like, and maybe there could be a peaceful solution, it's just... I, I, this could have... the world could have been set up a little better to make this make more sense, to make it seem like, okay, fighting really is inevitable here. Whereas in this, it just seems like everyone involved is being kind of a dick, but also everyone involved is kind of a victim. And I mean, like, maybe that's some sort of commentary on how war works, but I, I don't think the author is really smart enough to do that. And anyways, uh, Hank eventually is talking to Nora, and he agrees to take an oath to leave her and her mother alone forever, as long as she will take an oath to lead his army. And if he, if he breaks his oath, he'll die. If Nora breaks her oath, her and her mother will die. And I, I'm not sure why he agrees to let her do it, because she doesn't have any, like, combat experience or anything. I'm not sure why he thinks she would be able to lead a rebellion. But she agrees to do it, and everything seems great for a minute, but then Hank uh, tries to burn Patch's feather. Now, Basically, the fallen angels in this world still have like one or two feathers that are scattered around and one of them's kept in heaven and then one of them is usually kept on earth. 
and if the feather is ever burned, then they're banished to hell for eternity. So Hank was essentially trying to kill Patch for all intents and purposes, and so Nora shoots him. I thought Nephilim were immortal. Maybe he became human with his oath. It's not really explained. God, j just make Nephilim not age, but they still die if you, like, shoot them or something. Okay? It's, it's not that hard. Anyways, the war ends, or the book ends with war coming. Now, I'm gonna say right now, books two and three needed to be combined. Like, th this series should have been a trilogy. Because both of those books waste a lot of time and there's just not enough material to m make two books out of it. They were both a huge slog to get through. But, luckily, we get to Finale, which this one is actually kind of good. I like this one. So, this one starts off with, uh, you know, Nora has to lead the Nephilim into war, and she's like, no, I, I don't want there to be a war. Like, we're just not gonna fight. And they're like, well, it's inevitable. You know, if you don't want to fight, people are, the people here are just going to kill you and install a different leader in your place. And if you can't uh, take your and if you don't fulfill your oath, you and your mom are going to die. So she's thinking, okay, I have to find a nonviolent solution to this, which is actually kind of a compelling conflict because it shows Nora did kill her father, and she feels bad about it, but she also understands that, like, yeah, it was something that needed to be done. And so in this, she's like, okay, I don't want to kill people unnecessarily, which is just a neat thing to do. It seems like most of the time in fiction, characters are either total pussies who will never ever hurt anyone for any reason, even if it's a good reason, or they are just complete psychos. So having something be in the middle is kind of compelling, and plus we get to see her and Patch actually be a couple throughout most of this book's book, which is, you know, that's nice. And it starts with Cheshvan being near, and so Nora has to train because, see, before she was descended from Nephilim, but she wasn't really a Nephilim, I think. I, I don't know. Again, that part of the series is never really explained that well. Like, how do Nephilim come about? Um, but despite that, uh, she is now a full Nephilim after taking her oath and everything, and so she has to train to learn her new powers, like super strength and mind powers and stuff. Turns out she's actually really good at mind powers, like invading people's minds, you know, co coming inside them and taking over. It, she's, she's good at that. And uh, she's training with a Nephilim named Dante. Now Dante, while he's training her, he repeatedly breaks into her house, watches her sleep, and at one point gives her water, which is laced with uh, devil craft, which is basically black magic, and in this case it's like steroids, which will make her stronger and everything. So he's drugging her. You know, maybe, may maybe she's only attracted to Patch because every man in her life is a psycho with boundary and control issues. Like, we don't know anything about her dad because he... He died before the series began, but I'm willing to bet that if if he, um, y yeah, I'm willing to bet he was also controlling and had boundary issues. So Patch and Nora, so Patch and Nora can't publicly date because, you know, they're on opposite sides and people on both sides will think that they're traitors for that. So they have a, a fake breakup and then <laughs> Nora tells Patch about how uh, Dante... <laughs> I can't, I can't even keep a straight face. Nora tells Patch about how Dante was drugging her, and about how the seed of evil had been planted inside her, and about, and then he's angry, and he's like, oh, he forced Devilcraft into your body. Again, third... Just work on your phrasing, Jesus Christ! You're telling me, man! So, throughout the book, uh, the... Fallen angels attack uh, Nora a couple of times, trying to assassinate her, and it never works. At one point, she gets stabbed with a knife that injects Devilcraft into her body, which makes her uh, kind of addicted to it, which is kind of neat. I like the way they handle it. Like, she acts weird and lies and steals a bit uh, because of her addiction, but they don't spend that much time with it, and they don't spend that much time with her overcoming it either, and either way, I think it would have been it would have been kind of neat to have more time spent with that, but whatever. And then uh, Marcy, at this time, learns about angels and stuff and about who her dad was, really. And then she moves in with Nora and her mom for some reason. Really doesn't add much to the story. And actually, it makes Nora's mom seem like kind of a bitch because she completely disregards her daughter's feelings on it. And I'm not sure why. It just straight up doesn't make sense. 
But basically, there's a few more attacks by fallen angels and stuff, and eventually they come up with a plan to prevent the war. So there is this archangel who's hanging out on Earth named Pepper, and he is getting up to some mischief, and so Nora and Patch and Scott say, hey, we're gonna tell your bosses about this if you, if you don't do what we want. And what they want is for him to go up to heaven, uh, take all of the fallen angel feathers, bring it back down to them, and then they're gonna hold them hostage and say, hey, if you guys go to war or possess Nephilim against their will or anything, we're just gonna burn these and send you to hell, and that'll be their plan to end the war. And so they get to Pepper, and they manage to convince him, but he's also being blackmailed by someone on Earth who he can't tell them the name because he took an oath, but they assume it's a fallen angel uh, because he's trying to help them create weapons which are have like holy, they, they do like holy damage or radiant damage or something. And um, they're like, okay, we, we can go meet him for you and we'll kill him or whatever. And then they go there and it turns out that the guy that's blackmailing him is Dante. Yeah, Dante is going to sell out all the Nephilim for his own benefit and just let the fallen angels kill or take over them. Uh, because I guess we need a villain now, we, we killed our other one, we, we need an antagonist of some sort. Now, Dante could have killed Nora at this point, but he he doesn't because he actually wants to usurp her uh, position as the leader of the Nephilim, and he actually has like photographs of her and Patch together, and he's like, ah, I'm gonna show them that you're a traitor, you can't escape me now. And from here, this is like the last hundred pages of the book, things go really fast, uh, basically. Nora challenges Dante to a duel, uh, because that would kind of steal his thunder, and she thinks if she can beat him in a duel, that will just make him look weak and like a liar and everything, so he won't be able to usurp her. Uh, and then she eventually breaks down and tells her friend V about angels and stuff, but it turns out V already knows, because V is a Nephilim, and V only found out she was a Nephilim, like, a couple of days earlier. This adds nothing, but it's there. Eventually, Pepper gets the feathers, and he brings them down to them, and he gives them a call, and he's like, hey, I have them at Patch's house, so come meet me there, and they race on over, but by the time they get there, Marcy got there first, and she actually burned them, because someone told her that Nora killed her dad, which, I mean, she did, but the, the circumstances were extenuating, let's say, and, um, yeah, it makes, it kind of makes sense why Marcy would be upset about that, but still, it, it does kind of suck. And uh, so all of the angels, including Patch, are sent to hell, and it is really sad and stuff, but Nora still has to have a duel with Dante, and so she goes there and with all the other Nephilim there to watch, and Dante's not there, and they're like, where'd he go? And then he brings an army of fallen angels with him that apparently he got out of hell. Yeah, apparently he can just go to hell and take people out of it. You know, all of the magic stuff in this series, um, every time it happens, I'm just like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess they can do that, because it's not set up at all. And he's able to lead them because he made them all swear an oath to be loyal and yada yada yada. And so a big epic battle happens, uh, Scott winds up dying, because apparently Nephilim can die again. <laughs> just like, just stop saying they're immortal. Like, they're clearly not immortal, just, just like, make them... Not immortal, but whatever. Scott dies, and then um, Dante is about to kill Nora, because, you know, he's a badass fighter and everything, and Nora's not, but using her uh, mind powers, she comes inside of him and makes him stab himself, and then he dies, and then because his angel army was connected with him, they all die too, because that's what all shitty villains do. They make their armies be attached to them, so that as soon as they die, everything ends. Okay, sure. And apparently Patch managed to get out of hell as well, because Dante specifically says he watched for his face in the crowd, and he, he wouldn't have let him pass. But uh, it turns out Patch actually came inside of another angel and possessed him, and managed to get out. And he, also because of that, he didn't swear an oath to Dante, so he's still here on Earth. He's there. He's okay, yay. And then an archangel pops up, he was a detective who has shown up in all four books so far, but I haven't mentioned him because he's an inconsequential character, and him being an archangel changes nothing about the plot. It's not a very interesting twist at all, and you could literally just replace him with a character who pops up at this moment, and it would not change anything. But anyways, he shows up, he's an archangel, he thanks Nora for her help, he gives her this magic ring, 
and tells her to like bleed on Patch basically. And then she does that and then her and Patch kiss and he's like, wait a minute, I can feel things now. I don't know what that means. Like it's not explained if he becomes a human because of this or if he's still an angel but now he can feel. It's not explained at all. Okay, I guess, I guess I'm still happy for him either way. And then there's the epilogue. It's just a couple of years later, V is getting married to some other guy who she met, who was not in the books up to this point, and uh, it also turns out that Marcy is dead, and <laughs> V and Nora have no sympathy for her whatsoever. In fact, they're kind of vindictive about this, which, like, on one hand, yeah, I get it, she did try to kill Patch, but also... Like, if, when you look at it from her perspective, it kind of makes sense, and so the, uh, these two being so vindictive and unsympathetic, like, I feel like that is just a bit of protagonist-centered morality. Like, anything that you do that hurts the protagonist is bad, and anything you do that helps them is good, and, like, I, I feel like maybe Nora being vindictive could have been an interesting character trait, but you would have had to explore it a lot more up until this point, so, uh... Yeah, uh, and then her and Patch are still together, and everything's happy. And that's the end. Overall, it, it, it could have been a lot worse. Like, bo both the ending is fine, and the series as a whole, it's really not that bad. Not not at all. Like, there there is more stuff that I could have critiqued, okay? There are some leaps in logic, there are a lot of dumb lines in there. Or, not a lot, but a decent number of dumb lines in there. There is a serious lack of world building. Like, there's a lot of stuff that is just straight up never explained, even if the bits that are explained don't make sense. Like, it's better to have a somewhat deep setting, but we don't have that. Uh, there's just a lot of wasted time, especially in the second and third books. But if you really look at this series on its own terms, like if you just look at it and say, look, this is a Twilight clone, let's just come at it from the perspective of a teenage girl who wants to read about romance, if you just look at it that way, it is all right. You know, and like I said, the last book is kind of good. It has a pretty good climax. I know I went through it really fast, but it is a fun battle, and the main characters do have to suffer, and uh, they do have to work pretty hard to get their happy ending. So it's not like everything's handed to them. Like like Fallen, if you remember that. Ooh, that The ending of that one was terrible for that exact reason. The heroes just got everything handed to them. Or Elixir is another good example, because <laughs> Elixir is the worst thing ever. But, yeah, on its own terms, it, it's fine. Now, is it the elusive good Twilight clone that I've been looking for for years? You know, the thing that is very clearly just a teenage girl supernatural romance, but has actual good story and characters and everything that I can genuinely enjoy with, without uh, any hint of irony or anything? No, it's, it's not that. But if you are looking for something in this genre, I think you'll love it. I, I do. Like, I've had a lot of people over the past few months tell me that, like, Hush Hush was their jam or something like that, but I, I get it, you know? I, even as a dude who was never super into this genre, if I had read this when I was, like, 14, I think I would have liked it a lot more than I do now. Like, I still would have noticed some of its flaws. And some of them would probably have bothered me even more than they do now, but I I would have enjoyed it. Like, there there is some real character, there is some real heart to it. Like, it feels like the author, Be uh, Becca Fitzpatrick, was being genuine with this. It felt like she was actually trying. And I will give it credit that it is a lot different than other entries in the genre that I've, that I've read. Like, there's obviously plenty of similarities, but there's plenty of bits that are uh, unique as well. And... You know, just overall, I I don't want to ramble on too much, but overall, I thought it was okay. And if you enjoyed this newer format where it's shorter and I don't go into quite as much detail, then go go ahead and tell me about it, and I'll do some, some more of those angel things in this format. And if you don't like it, then I will just do, like, regular reviews or something with them. Either way, I'll see you guys later. Special thanks to all my patrons, you guys are the best, and special thanks to my $10 and up patrons, including 
Apo Savulainen, Ava Tuma, Brother Santodis, Christopher Quinten, Deanna Dahim, Embis, Emily Miller, Joel Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Madison Lewis Bennett, Microphone, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vacuous Silas, and Vevictus. You guys rock! I love you almost as much as I love Gerard Way. Please like this video, comment, and subscribe to show me that you are not a prep.